Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to, to be here today and to kick off the, you know, the extravaganza of AUKUS for the day. Um, so this panel is going to be focusing on the political resiliency of the AUKUS partnership, focusing on the specific interests and strategic priorities of our three key members, Australia, the US, and the UK. And we have assembled um, an excellent group of panelists here to talk about the country's perspectives and discuss their views on how AUKUS addresses resolving global and regional challenges, strengthens trilateral part, uh, cooperation, which is obviously a big part of what AUKUS is all about, and adheres uh, and basically helps to sort of respond to the shifting political and technological landscapes. So the, the panel will provide insights on the strategic and, um, and individual perspectives that contribute to AUKUS's strength and effectiveness in promoting regional security and stability. So why is it so important to get AUKUS right from the beginning? Um, briefly, we need to basically appreciate the fact that AUKUS is really a, a grand exper experiment. And it's an experiment in technology sharing at the highest, most sensitive levels. We've never gone there before. And it's being executed in the context of a, a trilateral organization, which again, is all very new. The recent ITAR exemptions, we're going to hear a lot about that today, are nothing short of monumental. AUKUS covers a lot of issues, notably the, the submarines, of course, in Pillar 1, but also the broader aspects of collaboration in terms of the you know, advanced capabilities in Pillar 2. From a um, security cooperation context, though, offer, AUKUS, to my view, offers really a, an opportunity to be able to look at many different ways of collaborating with our capable allies in terms of international armaments cooperation, for example, and a real, hopefully a real step up in terms of collaboration, in terms of cooperative defense and cooperative production. It offers the opportunity for the United States, in some cases, to, to follow rather than lead in terms of capability development, and potentially even offers the opportunity for the United States to be able to import innovation from our allies, in particular niche areas. And I think I find this all very exciting because it sort of complements the historical approach to working with our allies. It's really about for military sales. Allies buy our capabilities, we figure out how to work together, interoperability improves, but this is different, and there are many different avenues that capability development can take. So before we start you know, getting to the, uh, these opportunities that I see out there, we're gonna um, ask the panelists to be able to focus really on the, the political landscape that has evolved since AUKUS was, um, AUKUS's inception three years ago. I'm going to ask the panelists to talk for about five minutes each, and then we're going to go into a Q&A session. So our first panel, or actually our, our third panelist, I have them in opposite order on my notes, but um, Matthew Steinhelfer, and Matthew is the U.S. Senior, um, the State Department's Senior Representative to AUKUS. James Caruso is the Senior Advisor and Chairman of the, to the Advisory Council of the Australia Chair at CSIS, and he's the former U.S. Ambassador to ASEAN, and I met him when he was a Chargé in Australia and John Moffat, who's the Minister Counselor for Defense Policy and Nuclear Issues at the British Embassy here in Washington. And I think we're gonna do things in order of James, John, and then Matthew. So I'll ask everybody to speak for about five minutes, provide some opening remarks, and then we'll get into the Q&A. Okay. All right, so I'm up first. Up first. Uh, I have, I'm not Australian, but I spent six years at two tours at the Australian Embassy, at the US Embassy in Australia, so I guess I'm honorary somehow. So I'm going to talk for Australia. When I arrived for my second tour in Australia in 2016, summer, where Australia was at that point was Australian officials at the most senior level telling me, don't make us choose between the US and Australia, uh, China. Don't make us choose, they said publicly, between our largest trading partner and our security partner. And the public line was two friends, one ally. That was our stop. Uh, and this was logical in many ways because Australia had gotten very rich from selling uh, iron ore, other minerals, milk, education services, tourism services to China to the point that about 28% of total Australian exports went to China and the margins were tremendous. They still looked to the US for security and you know, big part of the Five Eyes Alliance for intelligence sharing, good allies in Iraq and Afghanistan, they're always with us but it was sort of a bifurcated view of the world. What happened? Well, the Chinese really helped the Australians change their minds. How? First, 
Uh, in 2016, a labor senator was found to be basically suborned by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, later on, uh, oh, Apple also mentioned in 2015, 2014, Australia leased on a 99 year lease the port of Darwin, northernmost port facing the South China Sea, to a Chinese company. Didn't tell us, even though we had just recently signed the agreement to have rotating Marines go through Darwin. Uh, and when uh, President Obama asked about this, he was told, well, you could read it in the papers. Not cool. <laughs> so there was some tension, but still always good allies. But the Chinese have ripped away any semblance of being good partners. Um, among other things, like I mentioned, the suborning of a labor senator, uh, trying to influence the Chinese community, uh, Confucius centers spreading uh, propaganda about uh, the alliance and uh, the US place in the world, and how Australia is a deputy and really needs to uh, break away. And of course, uh, when Prime Minister Turnbull eventually said, we don't want Huawei in our 5G network, uh, the gig was up, and China started putting on all sorts of uh, barriers to Australian exports, not critical ones like iron ore, but things like wine and lobsters and things of that nature. And it got worse and worse. So that from uh, two friends, only one ally, now it's, we are all in with the US. AUKUS is the biggest bet Australia's ever made in defense. Uh, aside from maybe in World War II when they said, all right, we're not depending on Britain anymore, we're depending on the US. Given that Britain was fighting for its life, it was a no-brainer. This is putting all the chips on the US and the agreement. So I'll talk later about where that stands, but it started off as a uh, liberal party project. Labor, when they got elected, wholeheartedly took it on. But this is the biggest, most complex agreement Australia has ever made that maybe any country's ever made. And the question of how much sovereignty do you give up for this increased security is a debate that I would argue is only beginning. Mm -hmm. And given that this is a 40-year commitment, Australia, the US, and Britain have to do more to keep explaining why it matters and why it's worth this tremendous cost and putting all their chips on the US. I'll stop there. Um, good morning, everyone, and, and thanks for the opportunity to come here and, uh, and, and speak today. Um, just a few kind of opening remarks from, from me on the political resiliency and, uh, and UK views on AUKUS. So, so I remember over three years ago now, when I, I first came across AUKUS, I was working in the Ministry of Defence uh, and was involved in some of those very early conversations about the concept and thought, wow, this is a pretty, a pretty special moment. This is a, an audacious plan. You know, there is some, something experimental about it, as you've said, Jennifer. But there is really quite something here. And I must say, in the three years since, that there's been a number of other kind of wow moments um, uh, that, that have appeared, which have kept my fate very much uh, in, in, in the concept. Uh, when I came out here t two years ago, as part of my job, I often had to look at things that are going wrong in the world, perhaps uh, conflicts in Ukraine, Middle East, et cetera. But the opportunity to work on AUKUS was something that really drew me to coming out here and, and to work on this at this time, given yeah, how, how seminal this is to kind of some of the kind of current security challenges we are we are facing, and I think you know, looking at what we have achieved over the last three years, whether it be the the optimal pathway uh, on delivering uh, SSNs, or kind of on the other hand, in a very different nature, uh, our export control reform, these are really quite remarkable things to have achieved, quite diverse things to have achieved uh, in the space of a, of a few years. I think, and I hope you come on to talk about this more in the Q and A, but. But three things for me that are, that are really important that have made this concept work. Well, firstly, it's the, <clears throat> it's the power of the idea. Um, it's a shared appreciation, shared analysis of the challenges across the three nations, and then of the response that, that's needed, whether that be the threats that we are facing uh, in the Indo-Pacific and, and globally, but also then about the response that's required, particularly the level of industrial collaboration that's required mm -hmm. uh, to respond to these threats and, and the cutting down the barriers between nations to, to deliver them. And we've seen that the power of that concept, really uh, a demonstration of that in the UK, where we had a number of changes in, in our leadership, uh, and we've seen that this power of this concept really uh, get traction throughout, and, and no signs of any flagging support um, uh, in, in the UK for the concept. I think secondly, it's about having the right foundations in place for AUKUS, and we've really put a lot of effort in that across the nations over the last few years. 
Um, clearly, all that is about money and committing the right, right funding at the right stage and getting the right contracts in place. Uh, but it's also other things, less tangible things, like the time of our leaders, who, whether they're the prime ministers, presidents, or defense ministers, foreign ministers, all putting huge amounts of personal time and capital into making uh, this work. There's then, and I say this as a kind of proud bureaucrat, you know, kind of governance and bureaucracy that we put in underneath that to, to make this work so that it can endure, that it will last, and that we are able to kind of tackle uh, new challenges as they face. And then some of the supporting agreements, treaties uh, behind it. And finally, I think it's about also, as well as building those foundations, being agile. So particularly when it comes to that narrative about the, the kind of policy envelope for AUKUS, being able to respond to challenges, to, to disinformation, to... Uh, to, to new ways of describing AUKUS and making sure that, as you've said, Jim, it, we make sure that it stays relevant uh, mm -hmm. and, and it seems to be delivering for um, uh, the defense of our nation. Thank you. Matthew. Great. Well, first and foremost, just uh, thanks very much to uh, uh, New America and Security and Defense Plus for having us today. I think this, these kind of forums are so important, um, especially as we, we talk about political resiliency, making sure that we actually have these kind of platforms to elevate the profile of these efforts and to, um, in many ways, get out that positive messaging of what we're trying to achieve. Um, for any of you that have uh, kind of uh, been at various events that I've spoken at, I always, I always say one thing. You know, it's, the AUKUS ambition is about more than just a couple of defense projects. Mm -hmm. The AUKUS ambition, and I think what we've all already um, started to touch on, is about how are we going to collectively evolve our, the nature of our partnership work to match the evolving threats um, that we're seeing, the operating picture that we're seeing? And you know, I think um, since I've come into this role and, and been working on AUKUS for a little over 14, 15 months, what I've seen is we're, we're really starting to build some momentum. And as I think about political resiliency, it's not just about um, do we have the political leadership and the right time in the right places um, and offices, but it's really about that. Um, in Australia, they often say social license here, public support, um, and so forth. But it's really about are we meeting um, not just the needs of um, those of us that pay attention to these kind of initiatives in the national security sector, but also the general public. Are we making it tangible? Are we making it practical and real? And I think that's twofold. Um, it's both sort of the operating environment picture. Um, are we getting out and explaining the national security uh, impetus, the national security threat? But it's also, are we, for the various constituents, ensuring that it's, um, they are seeing progress and demonstrating that we are demonstrating progress along the way. So I think in the past year, collectively, across the trilateral system, we've had a really heavy emphasis on let's get out more messaging, not just to our, our three countries, but also to the broader region of what are we doing? When I walked in the door, everyone told me, including uh, in civil society and think tanks and, and elsewhere, you know, AUKUS equals submarine deal. And I kept looking back at our Indo-Pacific strategy, the public uh, leader statements, and variety of documents, and, and I saw that it was more than that. And so that's where we've been building up this, this case that AUKUS ambition is more than just a couple of defense projects. That we can do. That's easy. That's not meeting the evolving threat picture um, of, uh, that, that we need to. So... You know, in the past year, our trilateral um, you know, progress on the optimal pathway has been tangible. We now have Australians um, here in our shipyards. We're seeing a lot of great progress on the enabling environment, including um, the great work that the trilateral partners did um, and our, our State Department colleagues on export controls. We're starting to see a lot more progress on Pillar 2. My bottom line, and uh, Jennifer and I have talked a lot about this over the past year, is we got to continue. We got to make it more tangible, more concrete, and continue to accelerate that progress. And I think the, the National Security Advisor recently um, has also emphasized that we recognize that, especially in Pillar 2, we got to continue to demonstrate that tangible Great. progress. I'll stop there. Great. Well, you've led into my first question really well. You've already start, started to touch on this, but 
So the question is, how has AUKUS demonstrated political resilience in the face of internal or external pressures or barriers, and what strategies have been effective in maintaining cohesion? You mentioned messaging a little bit. You've also talked about the, you know, the export control rollout. Are there other examples that you can think of that have really helped to sort of push things forward? Any sort of internal strategies that may not have been apparent to the public that, that you can talk about? Yeah. Thanks. And then you can answer them in any, any order that you'd like. So. I'll, I'll start on this one, and then I'm going to, because this one's easy, <laughs> <laughs> at least for me. Um, I think the, the first point on this is this is a long-term effort, AUKUS, right? And um, I think we can't uh, take for granted that, yes, we have great bipartisan support across the three systems. We've seen some early transitions, but it is very early on. So I don't want to say that we've learned any lessons yet. Um, there are some good activities so far. Um, sort of three points, one strategic, one operational, and one structural. I think the first on the strategic, um, you know, it's, really important that um, in AUKUS that we don't focus again on it as a, a singular project or a program. I often bristle when I hear that AUKUS is a program. It's bigger than that. This is a long-term endeavor across um, historical partners. And at the strategic level, in order for it to work, we have to constantly do outreach, but not just to communicate our message, but to more importantly, listen and bring in that advice and counsel and evolve, recognize that we need to involve um, our work over time and have that flexibility. So I think for that strategic flexibility is really important. Um, on the operational level, we've done massive amount of work behind the scenes on governance structures. And that's really important uh, because now we have these governance structures that are in place. They're not too rigid. We've already had some uh, you know, adjustments internally based off of what we see is working and what's not trilaterally. Um, but what those, op those governance structures are allowing us to do is if individuals change in and out, whether that's at the political level or um, even at the bureaucratic level, um, that's okay. We've got consistency. We have structures that we can rely on um, governance wise. And, um, and, and ensure that the work of AUKUS proceeds. And then lastly, structurally, at State Department, as many of you know, um, thanks to the direction of the US Congress and support of the Deputy Secretary of State, the Secretary, the Undersecretary, we've really focused on long-term institutionalization of AUKUS. So um, uh, it's not just, I'm not just saying that because you know, I benefited, benefited by becoming uh, the AUKUS Senior Advisor for the Secretary and having an office and those kind of things, but that we all felt was really important, um, independent of, of the individual in the office because especially at State Department, for this long-term endeavor, you have to have that institutionalization to, over time, ensure that there's a tension at a high level across the, the bureaucracy that's being applied um, in multiple regions, multiple function areas um, to advance the AUKUS effort. As I mentioned, this AUKUS was a Liberal Party project wholeheartedly endorsed by labor because China put so much pressure on Australia on the economic front and after the foreign minister uh, asked for a uh, independent review of what happened with COVID, uh, the, the Chinese embassy eventually gave a list of 14 actions that Australia must do to rectify things. And, you know, with due respect to all my Australian colleagues, you don't deal with Australians that way. <laughs> they, get, they get a little upset. So, social license for doing something was there. And this was the big answer, it was with the biggest uh, partner, security partner, so everything was moving forward. But you know, we're democracies and over time, unless there's real strong progress, which I think you can point to, especially in the subs, people start asking questions, first of all. Second of all, uh, the Labor Party government is having, as most governments do, midterm, getting weaker. Uh, they are being attacked from the left by the Greens, who are resolutely anti-AUKUS, by the so-called Teals or Independents, who also are uh, at best AUKUS skeptic. And they're having more and more journalists uh, from the right and left who are questioning the cost and whether this is the best place to put your money. 
because Australia is doing things like uh, cutting back on conventional surface ships, uh, not buying additional uh, joint strike fighters, uh, mm -hmm. selling a bunch of their tanks. So they're saying our conventional forces are being shrunk. Our budget for these nuclear subs going forward, you've pushed out eight years according to the budget. We are at risk until these things start coming on Made by 2030s, and oh, by the way, we put all our chips on a country, the U.S., which is going through its own political uncertainty. So is this the best way to go? So this is an ongoing discussion. So far, so good. But we really need to show progress on Pillar 2, to show three years on. The anniversary of, of the signing was, I think, September 21, coming right up. Yeah, so we need to show progress on Pillar 2. Uh, Ship maintenance on, on a Virginia class will take place in Perth soon, which is good, except for all these Americans who are going to take housing in Perth, where housing is already really expensive. Will that cause tensions? So there's a lot going on uh, that will require continued discussion by senior people in Australian government and society about why this big, audacious plan requires big, audacious budgets and action. Continuous for 40 years. Just to follow up there, a, a, a few points. Um, I think the, the, the context uh, has, has helped us as AUKUS ha has evolved. The world has only got a more dangerous place since we made the, the first announcement a, a few years ago. And what comes from that? Well, I think firstly, just the essentialness of, of industrial collaboration, deep industrial technological collaboration between, between partners, be between allies, and how vital that is to any kind of current, current conflict, including kind of co-production. Co um, and then just the requirement for the advanced capabilities that we are, we are talking about with uh, AUKUS as well. I think uh, we've learned lessons around our, our narrative and how, just how vital that narrative is, whether that's internationally or, or, or domestically. And obviously, the AUKUS annou announcement was a surprise uh, for, for most people, and that, and that took a bit of handling. Um, but we've moved to a very different approach now, a much more active approach in communicating our narrative and avoiding surprises, um, particularly in the region. Um, where obviously there are a great deal of sensitivities, uh, particularly around uh, SSNs, and we've done a lot, I think, as, as I said, it's gone a long way to uh, dispute the idea that's just about nuclear power submarines or some of the other disinformation um, that was out there. But that's going to be ever more vital in the years ahead, as this is a, a genuinely long-term project. Um, so I think, you know, and, and then sending it to the, to the public as well, and I uh, was lucky enough to go to a, a NASCAR event a few months ago, and uh, was very surprised to then see an AUKUS uh, Kind of brand uh, across one of the cars there, uh, which I was highly impressed by the efforts of the US government to, to, to get the message out there. But that's important. Um, and we're doing Transit UK as well. We've uh, announced our own nuclear strategy, and that's not just keeping it in a defense side, that's talking, talking about things across government. So, what are the skills we need in the right places for our, for our industrial base? Um, what's the infrastructure we need uh, in places up in the northwest of England where we build our, our, our submarines? And seen about this, as, as you've said, Matt, not, not just a, a, a defense project, but something that is a, 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 national, a national effort. Uh, yeah. Um, speaking of advertising, I, I don't know if you all saw the Super Bowl, but there was an August at the Super Bowl. I was shocked. I'm like, I've got to play that again. <laughs> so uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk. Think, still think about the narrative, but think about it on a regional, a regional level. So the next question is, what role does AUKUS play in prioritizing regional security and stability in the Indo-Pacific, and what successes have been apparent so far? And my add-on to that, is there, is there a plan in play for coordinating with regional organizations? Anybody want to go first? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go first. Just, I spent a lot of my career in <coughs> Indonesia and Thailand and ASEAN. Mm -hmm. um, so when this first was announced, they were real unhappy. They weren't informed. Uh, they were real unhappy because they say, this is the Anglos getting together again, and that never worked out well for us. Um, John said, nuclear, nuclear is a four-letter word, comma, despite the fact Australia is the biggest exporter of uranium. Um, and there's distrust, basically, what, what this all meant. Is this going to be the Anglos dictating policy to us through strength? But over time, through the efforts of our three nations and constant discussion about what this really meant, they're not nuclear armed. We countered the Chinese propaganda that they're going to be nuclear equipped, that somehow nuclear radiation is going to leak out of the reactors on the ships. They've come around to saying, okay, this may actually be a net 
additive to the regional security. Um, and we've seen that certainly in Indonesia, where Australia and Indonesia just signed uh, an enhanced defense cooperation agreement, which is really, really something. You also see Indonesian troops exercising in Darwin with Australian and U.S. Marines. That's quite something. Uh, and, and they've basically gone quiet in Southeast Asia about what AUKUS means. They're, they're not hugely supportive publicly, but the fact that they're quiet about it, it means a lot. Now, Pacific Islands is another matter. Mm -hmm. uh, the point you raised about whether we need to do more. So we've been advocating at CIS, CSIS this idea of having maybe a yearly conference for all the interested parties to talk about it, bring them into the game, tell them what we're doing, see if there are ways to expand cooperation that way. I think we go a long way. I would add, um, you know, because this is what we spent a lot of time on at State Department. Um, one, of the, one of the first things that we did um, when I first arrived was create, instigate, you know, foment uh, in a positive sense, a trilateral structure um, where um, effectively, not exclusively the diplomats, but the diplomats could get together trilaterally and talk about these kind of issues, both in an unclassified and a classified space. Um, we pulled in all of the tools that we have in our toolbox, especially at State Department, from reaching into our data analytics teams, our disinformation teams, our survey analysis groups, um, a wide variety um, of entities to first do an assessment of what are we doing, what's working, what do we need to do differently? And I think one of the first things that I observed early on, especially related to the region, was that our messaging just wasn't landing. Um, if you look at um, you know, then versus now, what we talk a lot more about now is about AUKUS having a positive impact to the region, that it's not just about, um, uh, you know, it, well, uh, it, it, we have a positive message, let me put it that way. And I think, you know, we've done a lot of really good work, and, and I will give credit to our Australian colleagues because they've really instigated a lot of it, is ensuring that every step along the way, whenever we do have a public announcement, that we proactively do pre-briefings for various countries around the world, for, that, for um, other institutions, um, for ASEAN members and, and countries, um, because we feel that that is one of our strengths, that transparency. Um, and, and I think that's bearing fruit. Where I think we need to head um, in the coming year, and this is something that um, I and my team have talked a lot about, is now's the time, especially as um, uh, for us at State, but also for others, to get out even more and do more engagements, not just at the government level, not just with the defense ministries or the foreign ministries, but with civil society and think tanks in, in the region. With go, don't be afraid to go talk to journalists and, and ensure that we're engaging in meaningful ways. And so I think we, we do a lot of that in our capitals, mm -hmm. but now we have to take it to the region to ensure that AUKUS is put into context. Um, AUKUS is just, you know, for the US, it's just one of many initiatives. So, um, uh, and, and I won't speak for other governments, but for, for those governments too, that it's one of many initiatives uh, for, the, for the region and that there are positive uh, net benefits. And I think we're starting to see some progress as a result. Yeah, I think just to, just to add, we, we've seen some, you know, that the changes in the regional reception, thanks, thanks to all the hard work of, of, of partners here and in improving that narrative and whether it's shifting to a kind of positive position on AUKUS or, or just moving to a kind of neutral position, uh, and not being actively hostile, we've we've seen some real some real shifts uh, with our partners in the region, and I think key to that is getting across. Uh, this is not a, an attempt by the the, the Anglo's, uh, as some have described it, to kind of seek a leadership role here. This is, should be complementary um, to other regional structures, whether that's ASEAN, whether that's that's other kind of regional groupings, and making sure that what we're doing is is seen to be supporting that. Um, and I think then looking at this from a, a UK perspective, it's much probably the most concrete example we have of the Indo-Pacific tilt that we've talked about in our, in our recent um, strategic reviews. Um, and clearly we're now putting a lot of effort behind it. But it has also, I think, been uh, uh, helped us get, get a foot in door for other initiatives. And we've, uh, in, in the kind of intervening period, uh, formed some new 
uh, agreements with Japan on reciprocal access. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, started Global Combat Air Program uh, with Italy and Japan as well. Uh, and we are looking at our, our membership, our partnership with, with uh, ASEAN and uh, CTP, CPTPP uh, and other groupings to make sure that we are, this is part of a, 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 broader, uh, a broader plan of engagement by the UK uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific. It's a great example, thanks very much. So none of you were involved in the early stages of setting things up, so maybe sort of think about this as from taking a step out looking back. So we're now three years on. What lessons to your mind can be drawn from the uh, experience of AUKUS so far to your mind, and how can these lessons be applied to other international alliances or partnerships? If you didn't want to take that last bit of the question, think about is there anything you would have done differently to set up AUKUS Pillar 1 or Pillar 2 for success? This is about lessons and sort of experiences. Thanks. Okay. Well, I, I should probably volunteer to go, to go <coughs> first uh, on that one. Uh, and look, I mean, every, every partnership is unique. Uh, Every, every partnership is different, and so we have to be careful about, about drawing too many lessons. I, I think I've already talked about a narrative and, and how, how vital that is to this. Uh, mm -hmm. and the narrative globally with our, with our, with our populations. Uh, and I'm, as we talked about, we've learned a lot uh, about that as we've, as we, we've gone through it. Uh, I think we've learned the value of, of being candid uh, with each other. I think that's one of the strengths of AUKUS is that because we have such strong shared existing defense links, members of the Five Eyes, uh, et cetera, um, shared historical cultural links. It, it allows us to have some, some, some candid conversations, uh, and we've been able to do that, which has meant we've been able to get through uh, setting up such a, such a very difficult things um, in, in a short period uh, of time. Uh, but I think then, as others have said, kind of getting those messages out uh, early on what we are doing, what this is achieving, uh, and setting up that kind of regular drumbeat of what's been done, and there was a bit of a trade-off there, um, particularly when it comes to, 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 to Pillar 1 with submarines. These are clearly long-term projects, uh, and they won't necessarily uh, produce uh, submarines for, for quite some time, but there are lots of things we can talk about in the meantime. There's lots of work we can do in the meantime that relates uh, to subsurface warfare, um, uh, and we should get on and, and communicate those amongst the other uh, advanced capabilities um, work that we are doing. Um, but I think, fundamentally, bring it back to where I started earlier, it's, it's about that shared analysis of the threat. If you can identify what, what the challenges are and what the response should, should be uh, and have firm agreement at the top level on that, the firm commitment behind it, then that gives you that foundation for everything else to come from. Thank you. Um, just to echo what John said, I think our, our, uh, our countries did a good job of sort of defining the problem uh, and this being a solution. For the Australian public, I think they I mean, how many people do you suppose know what ITAR is? Mm. Suddenly, everyone in Australia knows what ITAR is. Uh, that was an education because it looks like something that a lot of analysts said, they'll never change it, it's too hard. The fact that the US did change it for this deal is very significant. Uh, and I wish the Australian government would talk more about how significant that is as an indication of how serious the US is about following through. So if we ever do it again, I think we need to uh, set up the scenario of, yeah, this is hard, this is why we have to overcome, but this is why we're so serious about it and why it's so important we're going to do it. Yeah, from, from my perspective, I always hesitate to say that there are lessons learned or um, that we can apply, you know, sort of in a cookie cutter approach to other initiatives. Um, this kind of, uh, you know, various examples from the AUKUS partnership, because I think AUKUS is pretty unique. Um, I think you know, the, the history, the longstanding history, the close ties between the US, UK, and Australia is very special in many ways. So I think that has flavored our um, work quite a bit. That said, I think w one of the things that um, we have, I think, done pretty well, it, especially recently, is um, kind of building off of what my colleagues mentioned, is continuing to elevate that uh, um, outreach and communication. I think we've done that well recently. I don't think that necessarily was the case early on of talking about um, the, the uh, strategic narrative. Um, and I think we have more progress to, to make on that 
Um, one area where I think we, we should have done more earlier on, it's easy for me to say just because I wasn't there at the very beginning, but um, I think really focusing especially on pillar two to make it tangible, concrete, and delivering projects quick. Um, I just, I, I think that's going to be, anyone that knows this business, it is very difficult to um, even uh, within one country to get an, a brand new project off the ground, resourced, contracted into production and so forth. So that takes time. There's a time frame to, to develop on that. And then you expand that trilaterally. That's another story. So continuing to um, uh, recognize that there is a, a, an importance to delivering or showing demonstrable results. And although I think we have um, and we've put published many of those in various defense minister meeting statements and those kind of things. It, there's the desire still for more and more tangible benefit, especially for Pillar 2. So I think um, it's fair to be critiqued. And I actually think that's good to listen to those and, and see what you can draw from it. We've not done this before, so I don't think it's a bad idea to critique. And of course. Yeah, look back. Yeah. Um, I have one more question, then we'll turn it over for Q&A. Is that OK, everybody? Okay, what, um, the last question is, what are the future directions and potential developments for AUKUS? We've already touched on some of these issues a little bit with bringing up ITAR, for example, but I want to push a little bit on that to see if we can get some concrete um, thoughts. Um, and how might AUKUS evolve to meet new challenges such in the, in the technological space or also to respond to all other sort of major geopolitical shifts? I'm happy to, to take uh, or to start this one. You know, I think, um, one of the obvious um, areas was that back in April, we announced um, that we were considering consultations, a very carefully crafted phrase, uh, considering consultations with Japan um, for pillar two projects. Um, you know, from my view, I think this, this is a, a great way to accelerate our progress. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of folks out there that say um, this can actually make it more challenging, gum up the system, make it more difficult. I think there are unique benefits from various countries um, where um, we can leverage that technical expertise and um, uh, help deliver uh, progress. At the same time, I think there's a, a real um, you know, defer deterrent effect that um, comes about from doing those kind of activities. So I could see some uh, continued progress in that space. I would also say that um, you know, we've made great progress on the export control environment. It still has to be implemented, of course. We just started at September 1. I often ask the question, what else do you need? Especially of small and medium enterprise. What's the next thing that's getting in your way? And how do we continue to evolve that enabling environment um, across the, th the three countries so that way AUKUS can be a catalyst for change, especially while we have strong bipartisan support across our three systems. So my hope is over the next year or so that we'll be able to get even more feedback about what else is needed. So we can try to insert that into our US policy process or a trilateral um, processes and see what can we do? What, what's, can we achieve yet another uh, cornerstone or marquee component of the AUKUS ambition? Just, just to add, I think, um the most remarkable thing we've achieved so far is on that enabling environment uh, and some of the announcements we've had uh, in, in recent weeks uh, and months. Uh, and that we are now beginning to look at um, the uh, ecosystem for, for investors, for, for industry, for innovation, looking at these issues as well. You know, so I think, uh, as Matt said, we need to keep going on that. Um, that, in some ways, is kind of the most transformative aspect of AUKUS in, in these early years is really uh, changing just how we work together and having fully, uh, being fully integrated uh, in, in many areas so that we are able to respond quickly to the, to the, to the threats we, we face and develop the capabilities to, to get after them. For me, that is the most remarkable thing, but we need to keep moving quickly on that front and, and not rest on our, our laurels. Then, then looking at the, the, the two pillars, I think, on, on pillar one with the submarines, uh, again, a bit of tension there. We need to, to, to get on and allow the programs to get on and uh, and deliver and really focus on, on timescales and, and meeting uh, the challenges we, we have there. We know from our own experience uh, in the UK, building nuclear submarines, is, it's a fiendishly uh, complex and, and long-term and, and demanding task, uh, which it needs to endure acro across generations. So we just need to make sure that we are you know, really focused on delivery in that, in that front, but also being able to show progress to our, to our, to our parliaments, to Congress, to, to our public uh, on what we're achieving there, because you know, huge sums are involved for, for all of us in investing in our, 
submarine industrial base and, and developments. But then, then pillar two, uh, you know, some, some question marks about uh, breadth versus depth. How many kind of projects do we want to get after? How many capabilities do we want to develop? How, how wide do we want to spread our bets versus really focusing on some, uh, some, some, some big bets and, and focusing there? And, and that's where a lot of the work is uh, at, at the moment. Uh, but again, you know, how, how can we get that advanced capabilities pillar to be contributing to the to narrative um, narrative that we have there? From the Australian point of view, um, we need to move fast on pillar two to get some actual deliverables fast. And there's concern that if we start spreading it out to other countries, that will just slow everything down and lose momentum. That's one. Two, from uh, the U.S. point of view, don't forget these are exceptions to ITAR specifically for the U.K. and Australia. If we try to expend it to non five by countries, sharing this highly classified information will be really, really hard. And don't forget that if we do IP with any of these other countries and it has a uh, military component, those countries need to get an export license from the U.S. So they are not exactly anxious necessarily to work with us in those situations. Um, before we leave the subject, I just want to raise an issue that's getting raised more and more because of the legislation about how we transfer the subs from the U.S. to Australia eventually, where there can, the uh, administration has to confirm there's no unreasonable risk in the transfer. So if, so if some admiral says, we need that sub, we can't give it to Australia, what happens? And AUKUS critics in Australia are seizing on this and saying, we are buying a pig in a poke, we're going to invest $3 billion in U.S. shipyards, and we have no assurance that at the end of the day we're going to have the sub. We need to find a way to push back on this narrative because it could really grow. It could really grow fast. Great. Thank you all. I have more questions. I'm going to hold them for now and go to the audience. Now, my eyesight's a little limited because I grabbed the wrong glasses. So please identify yourself and your organization, and I hope the folks at the microphone can go around and find people. <clears throat> Uh, gentlemen, yep. gentlemen, thanks for your uh, your foray today. Just interested in understanding again that singular focus. We've got, uh, we've had an election in the UK. We've got one here in two months. We've got one in Australia before uh, May next year. We've got war in Europe. We've got war in the Middle East. We've got contestation in space. We're at war in cyber. How is it that democracies such as ours are going to maintain focus uh, in a program that is decades in its delivery in the context of current emergencies and what also economically appears to be budget emergencies as we move deeper into this decade? Because again, uh, debt around COVID, the ability of the three economies to service their own domestic priorities in a pretty contested budgetary environment how do you maintain that singular focus? I mean, you've talked about unified purpose and action in terms of the public narrative, Jim, in particular. Uh, and what I would say is the debate in Australia is somewhat held back by the fact that the government and the military on one hand have all the information and those AUKUS protagonists and the doubters don't have a lot and so they're left to fill in the blanks. And so with all of that in the admixture of public discourse and strategic anxiety, uh, how do you think we're going to bulletproof AUKUS across particularly the next 10 to 15 years? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, it's easy. Um, no, look, the, the elections in Australia have to be held by May. Uh, the Greens are really making headway against some labor seats in the inner cities uh, so that there may be a minority government or some sort of coalition required to rule. It could be really, really hard to move things forward in that scenario. And the government could fall at any moment if, say, the Greens or the Teals decided to. And we're looking at this for years, that there's a movement away from major parties in all our democracies. So uh, I have no good answer except the need for military leaders, political leaders, to be more transparent and talk about, here's the problem, this is why we think this is a solution, and argue it publicly, not keep so much classified, because it's not like our adversaries aren't aware of what we're saying. I think just from a, a UK perspective, um, 
our Prime Minister, when he came out here just after election for the, for the NATO summit, and he, he talked about AUKUS uh, as being one of those, those, those top priorities for the, for the new government in, 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 in this space. Uh, and we've not seen uh, that, that change since then. Indeed, we've embarked on a strategic defense review, uh, and within terms of reference, uh, is, is you know, direction to keep going with all the work on AUKUS. We were doing work to look at how we might do things like differently organizationally or making sure we have the most efficient structures in place for us in the UK, but it's very much you know, still a, a top priority for us uh, with, our, with our new government. Um, uh, and we've seen that previously with, with other changes uh, in, in leadership. I think you mentioned uh, Ukraine and your Atlantic. Is this a distraction, particularly for countries like, like the UK, where we are you know, anchored in that, in, that, in that hemisphere? Well, I think the advanced capabilities we're talking about in AUKUS, whether it's submarines or, or, or the other capabilities under development, it, these are clearly relevant, uh, and particularly uh, of particular utility in the Euro-Atlantic uh, as much as they can be in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and the nature of that threat, we've seen a join up uh, between, between China, North Korea, Iran, Russia, when it comes to the, the proliferation and spread of, uh, of some of their advanced capabilities, uh, it really demonstrates to us that the merit of, of working with our partners in, in the Indo-Pacific as, as, as well. Um, but I do, I do take, as Jim said, the, the, that information gap um, is, 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 is really important here. There's always going to be a tension, given the, the sensitivity of things we're working on, between how much we can disclose and at what time, uh, and given the interest that some, some of our, our, our competitors might have in understanding those capabilities. So there will always be a tension, but that's why I think you know, we need to think creatively uh, in our systems about how we get the message out there uh, for our populations and, and to uh, in influence the international environment too. Uh, from my perspective, from a U.S. national security strategy, whether it's uh, however the election goes, I, I don't foresee that the Indo-Pacific will be deprioritized. I think if anything you've seen in this administration in particular, um, that even with the number of crises, the Indo-Pacific is um, a real priority across uh, the, the U.S. administration, bipartisan support. Um, I think our, our mission in Australia has received um, you know, record numbers of congressional delegations and staff deals and, and other things. There, there's real interest, appetite, support. I think the, the broader point, though, is how do we ensure that we're building the business case for a variety of audiences? Mm -hmm. And I think there's probably more data that we need to collect on um, why AUKUS in particular as part of our broader, at least from the U.S. perspective, broader Indo-Pacific strategy is really good for, you know, if it's for the American people if, that we're talking to, why is it good for the American people? If it's for the Australian people, why is it good for the Australian people? And I think we need to do a better job of, of uh, thinking about that. Um, I know we're doing some internal um, um, sort of dialogue on this. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, to collect some of that data, but I think it's so important for us to do so because that's where we're going to have more salient messaging than just, well, it's, it's a national security impetus. That's, that's ethereal for the average citizen, and so we need to do a better job of making it concrete and real. I think there's huge benefits, especially in, the Austra in Australia, um, jobs, um, there's, there's real investments that are being made. Yeah, it's easy to critique some of the decisions, uh, but I think it'll be um, more difficult to critique those decisions when you start to see real positive um, outcomes as a result. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Robin Walker. Uh, I'm with uh, Air Force Futures. Um, we're doing some aucus type things. We have an Australian ex uh, Air Force exchange officer. We have two British exchange officers. They're not officially under an AUKUS umbrella, um, but it definitely leans into that kind of stuff. So I, I applaud the desire to expand beyond the idea that AUKUS is just a submarine deal, because um, it is more than that. But I think we need to do some work within the US government to make that um, more of a reality as well. Uh, I'll give you an example here. Our, our Australian exchange officer was a co-author of our Air Force future operating concept. He went back to Australia. We have a new Australian exchange officer now who's also great. And the previous one back in Australia can't see the document that he wrote here in the United States. Um, so I, I'm interested in, in ideas that you might have to 
expand to the air domain a little bit more and make that a little bit more tangible and, and more real, especially as we face some of the difficulties of things like the ghost bat uh, co combined collaborative aircraft there um, and the difficulties as the U.S. tries to buy it and buy it directly from Boeing Australia as opposed to going through Boeing U.S. for all the difficult reasons there, um, but also some ways that we can get some quick wins here again to build momentum and to have something tangible to point to to say this is a good thing let's continue to build that momentum and not let it wither on the the vine potentially as you have some political changes here thanks let me let me talk about the, the information sharing because I, I was a foreign policy advisor at indopaycom so the deputy commander of uh, user pack is aussie and yet so many of the documents, the cables that come out, are no foreign, no foreign eyes. Or five eyes, but it's a habit. And it's the same sort of blind habit. So our Air Force commander, I believe, said, if you are going to classify something no foreign rather than five eyes releasable, you need my clearance. Boy, did that change fast. So that's the sort of action we need and that change in mindset, that if we're all in this together and we're already sharing the information, stop being a miserable bureaucrat and do the right thing. I am not a miserable bureaucrat <laughs> <coughs> most days. Um, no, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I'll just, uh, can't say the specifics, but I will say we have gone, um, we have moved miles, uh, moved, moved a lot to um, uh, ensure that we're able to share information, um, including working with uh, a variety of, to get a variety of products moved from uh, labeled no foreign to uh, be able to be passed. Now, that's not institutionalized, though. And, you know, State Department, I don't control any of that policy, um, so we have a lot more work to do in that space. This is a, a common uh, conversation. I, I would say on the broader point, though, um, I don't think that everything has to be labeled AUKUS um, in order for it to have um, or benefit from AUKUS. Um, I think that there especially because of the export control environment that we just established. And, you know, Department of Commerce, by the way, moved also uh, before uh, State Department with, with us in partnership, but they also moved um, some um, uh, exemption in place back in April. Um, and so I want to give them credit too. But because of that new environment that's now in effect, I don't think AUKUS impact is just going to be unidirectional. It's no longer government just dictating what the actions uh, need to be and what progress will look like. Now it's gonna be multi-directional. Now you're gonna see, I hope, innovators from uh, Brisbane to Boston to uh, Bristol collaborating independent of government uh, being involved. I think that's gonna be really exciting. That's where true innovation is going to lie, and that's where we're going to have real AUKUS ambition, AUKUS uh, um, impact. And uh, I, that's where I'm hopeful that we'll start to be able to achieve. I know my team, we're, we're doing a lot of outreach to a wide variety of entities, probably to the chagrin of some of my interagency and trilateral colleagues. But um, the whole point of it is so that way we have this network, these feelers out to collect that data, because that's what I need to bolster the political resiliency over the long term for AUKUS. And it, we can't just have it be whatever we put out in a, a statement. Mm -hmm. It also means DOD has to change its procurement policies so these things actually get to delivered. So work on that. And there's, there is some work, the, the trilateral system, on, on that. That's it. <laughs> yeah. so just on information sharing, uh, we, we've been working on this with, with the DOD, with other partners for, for, for years now. Uh, and I must you know, give thanks to the US government. They've, they've made some, 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 some great achievements uh, from our perspective in this space. I think, as you kind of touched on, Jim, sometimes this happens particularly well in times of crisis or down to the kind of personal intervention of, of seniors. It, it's probably then kind of institutionalizing uh, that, those information sharing arrangements so that the default is, is to share with, with, with value partners like we have uh, in, in AUKUS. And that's not just for kind of you know, operational military type issues, it's also for, for project arrangements as well. Uh, which may not get the attention as, as quickly uh, from some of the most senior people who, who can make the changes here, but are you know, just massively important for us, you know, particularly making progress on, on the advanced capabilities. Uh, 
I'm just going to take the chair's prerogative to just answer that question too. At RAND, we've done a lot of work looking at the people-to-people -people relationships in and around information sharing, and you know, brought up the you know the exchange and the LNO problem. The you know our exchange officers, when we host foreign exchange officers, they are staff positions, and they they are integrated and they have access to just about everything. But the other hat they could wear is a liaison officer, and that person is only allowed to share information with back home, and usually gets cut out of of meetings that they're supposed to be in. So personally, I think there should be a review within AUKUS of where we have our exchanges and LNOs to make sure that if they're in the right position, doing the job, and they can get access to the information that they need. There are questions over here? Or back there, or <laughs> um, wherever, whoever was first, because I can't <laughs> see. Okay, you, you, you pick. Uh, Ken Gleiman from uh, Arizona State and the Future Security Initiative. Um, pillar one is big, it's complex, it's going to be measured in singular, unique uh, boutique capability. Um, yesterday we talked a lot about the future of conflict being small, uh, smart, ch uh, cheap, inexpensive. And, uh, and we also talked a lot about prediction yesterday. And I think that if you measured, if every expert put on their hat here, now to be clear, I'm a supporter of AUKUS, big time. But pillar one is more likely to fail than pillar two. I mean, just given all the, the complexities of it and the challenges, if pillar one fails, does pillar two come down to? Sorry to be the guy asking that, that question, but, uh, but I, I am concerned about the future of, uh, of AUKUS in general. Thank you. I'll jump on that real quick. I, I actually, um, and granted, I'm not a, a, a Navy planner, but I talk to them all the time. I talk to uh, uh, the, the submarine industrial base community. Um, I talk to uh, folks on the Hill, not just my committees, but, but others. I, I, I know there's challenges, and it's an ambitious effort, but we need it. Um, and I, I'm actually pretty positive on Pillar 1 being successful over the long term. There is so much focus on a regular basis on everything from the big picture strategic down to the really nitty gritty. Like, you know, what do we have the right type of support mechanism um, in Pearl Harbor for the Australians? Or what do we do in X, Y, and Z if we need uh, uh, communications? I, I just think that over the long term, I see that continuing to develop I think it's elevating the profile of what's probably been um, underappreciated that we need to focus on for quite some time. And so I, I'm actually, I'm not gonna answer your question uh, in some ways because I, I, I truly believe it. I think this is the right thing for us to do. We need to, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic we'll get it done. So just on pillar one, I think, I'd agree. I think you know, we've done the analysis about future threats and I don't think you can Simplify it to the, to the future is all about uh, being, being smaller and smaller. Uh, and that's why we are investing huge amounts of money in my country and all the three nations on, on uh, nuclear submarines uh, in, in the coming decades and, and you know, for the rest of the century, really. Um, so I, I think worth bearing that in mind. I think you know, pillar, pillar one, you know, succeed or fail, is probably you know, a, a, bit, a bit too binary. Obviously, what we need to focus on is getting the boats uh, done uh, on time uh, to the capability required. Uh, and at, at the budgets we, we, we've set them. Uh, and that as ever with huge you know, capability programs in defense uh, ministries is, is, is not easy. Um, and that is you know, a, a real kind of overriding focus, uh, a focus at, at the moment. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jack Krapansky, unaffiliated. Um, I'm just wondering about NATO. Uh, what is the relationship between AUKUS and NATO, and how would you compare the two? And is there overlap, and is there potential for confusion and finger pointing if China does something that is in an area where NATO thinks it has some interest, and AUKUS thinks it has the controlling interest? Yeah, that's a great question. If I can jump on that, just because this is actually a key um, area of, frankly, disinformation. Mm. That um, you know, one of the, the frequent things I combat is people calling AUKUS an alliance. AUKUS is not an alliance. Um, also, we are not uh, trilaterally trying to ex create a new Asian NATO in the Pacific. That is some of the, the uh, disinformation that's being 
uh, put out there by our adversaries. So um, for um, operational or uh, sort of those purposes, we try to, um, at least from my end, try to ensure that we uh, are very careful and judicious in that space. Yeah, absolutely, I think you know, nations that are in AUKUS, particularly Australia, obviously, um, you know, in, their, in their partnership work with NATO, taking forward our collaboration, absolutely, but that is, I think, completely separate from the AUKUS, AUKUS partnership itself. Right, NATO's the alliance, Australia's a major non NATO member, whatever the term is, and that said, AUKUS is a technology transfer agreement and uh, technology cooperation agreement. So. Other questions? Yeah. Like I said, you pick. <laughs> it's easier. Hi. Uh, can't tell if it's on, but I can project. Uh, Matthew, uh, you you mentioned. Oh, by the way, I'm Thorne Wright from Arizona State University. Uh, that State Department is has institutionalized AUKUS, uh, gave you an office and all these things. Um, that is evidence of the political resiliency of AUKUS is to see this kind of institutionalization. Are we seeing it across uh, different departments? Obviously, defense and state are the logical ones, but also commerce and some of the others. And then likewise, in the partners, are we seeing that similar kind of institutionalization across defense ministries, foreign ministries, things like that. Yeah, absolutely, and um, uh, it's a little unfair because my defense colleagues aren't are on stage, but you know that they, they are doing work there. They also made um, some internal decisions of where to place um, AUKUS, and and you know that's in each of these areas. Although I think mine's in law, so it makes it a little difficult for it to move, but. Um, there, there are a lot of conversations about where does it make sense for institutionalizing AUKUS for that long-term uh, presence and uh, focus. Um, in um, other governments, they're also uh, really focused. Uh, in the, I can at least talk about the foreign ministries. There are, in the UK, there's an AUKUS task force and we, we talk all the time. Um, in uh, Australia, in the uh, in DFAT, there's also an AUKUS team that's at the table, and I, I think that kind of connectivity and institutionalization just across our foreign ministries um, and having those POCs is so critical for the long term. I think just on a more of a defense perspective, um, yes, we are we are setting up specific AUKUS structures. We had them in place, um, both in our MOD and in, in a sense of our government, and we're just doing some work in moment to check we have the right, the right people in the right places. But, but it's also important to say that having completely separate AUKUS institutions is not necessarily always the best idea, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, MOD, DOD, and the way they spend money. You want AUKUS to be one of your key objectives for your, your key leaders who are delivering capability in the round, that they are thinking about AUKUS in all of the work that they do, not just that it's happening in a separate office kind of down the corridor and being ignored. So I think there's a right balance between having that kind of, you know, a bespoke leadership looking particularly at that kind of the political leadership, the, the narrative, uh, and how we get that across. But then in terms of delivering those capabilities, uh, you need that to be kind of really embedded within your, your, your ministry as well, from, from, from my personal experience. Yeah, in Australia, there's an office in the Office of Prime Minister and Cabinet that does AUKUS. They, this is the biggest thing they got going in defense, so they care. He's there. <laughs> She's in charge. All right. uh, Dave Maxwell from the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy. And thank you for your remarks. I'm a little confused now, though, because I thought I heard you say we want to expand AUKUS to other threats beyond uh, just being a program. Uh, but I just heard that it is only a program and it's technology transfer and that. So I'm, I'm curious uh, if, if there is going to be any kind of AUKUS um, strategy development and, and strategic planning to deal with other threats in, in other realms, for example, malign activities and strategic competition. Um, and, um, and so I'm curious, is there a methodology and a mechanism for developing strategy beyond just the technology transfer? And then my recommendation to consider a, a line of effort is the three countries special operations forces, uh, which are really well integrated and interoperable, and they could, you know, have strengths that could be uh, very complementary employed in the, in the region, uh, you know, against malign activities there. And so is there any thought to, uh, you know, expanding this into other areas beyond 
submarine pillar one and information transfer and, uh, and, and into doing some other things where we can get synergistic effects from the three uh, nation special operations capabilities. Um, so I describe AUKUS as a um, security partnership. I don't describe it as a tech transfer agreement um, that has been out there. So I'm not, um, it's, I think probably earlier on in the AUKUS description. Um, we, we do have sort of in, in pillar two, the six core capability areas. Um, I won't list them out because I'll probably forget one. Um, the, uh, from my perspective, you know, it, advanced capabilities um, under pillar two, if you only focus on those six narrowly defined or, you know, some of them are a little bit broader than, um, than others, but those six areas, how do you know that you're actually focusing on the future threat? So you have to create some openness to a little, you know, be, being able to have a little bit of innovation, but you can't be so far and wide that you try to boil the ocean, right? And so um, this is where I go back to the earlier question where I don't think everything to have an AUKUS impact needs to be labeled an AUKUS uh, program or project um, per se. My point was that the enabling environment that was the AUKUS was the catalyst for, but is bigger than AUKUS, right? Um, the, the ITAR exemption is far bigger than those six core narrow pillar two areas. We did that on purpose. And so um, we're going to see that multi-directional collaboration and innovation outside of AUKUS, independent of AUKUS, the, the government driven components of AUKUS. And so, um, I think that is what we need to capture and understand rather than just focusing on labeling everything in AUKUS project in those six core areas or create a seventh working group or whatever it may be. I, I just don't know if that's going to be the benefit for AUKUS long term. Yeah, I think at the outset we didn't necessarily precisely define exactly how to characterize uh, AUKUS and that was I guess nature by which it came about it being a capability first. Uh, kind of, kind of, kind of grouping of of, of, of nations, um, but I think we are now setting on this, you know, par partnership uh, focus on on capabilities and and, and technology and developing those. Um, I, I, there's always been a tension between getting on delivering what we've agreed to, particularly pillar one, and then keeping that space for innovation, uh, for spiral development of, of some of the other advanced capabilities, ensuring that the pillar one capability is going to be the right thing uh, to deliver at the right time. Um, but that's why the enabling environment work is so important, so that we are able to move more quickly than historically. Uh, histor historically, we have when it comes to these kind of joint, joint capability partnerships. Getting onto that, I think, will really mean we can move a bit, bit more quickly. Right. As Matt said, the fact that ITAR has been not limited to these technologies, we're already seeing private investment funds being formed to invest in things beyond just these capabilities. So I, I think, yeah, we shouldn't take, put it in a box like that. As far as uh, special ops, they have all sorts of other ways to work together that I don't think AUKUS mm -hmm. is needed. Is, is there a process in place right now for labeling projects, AUKUS versus non-AUKUS? What, what does the process look like for basically selecting versus whether it goes a bilateral track or the AUKUS track or some other track? Because there, there are obviously different, different ways to get to N with capability development and investments, depending on how something is labeled. Is that I, think, I think it helps, we have, we have a pretty you know, substantial governance aspect at AUKUS. Uh, our defense ministers meet uh, uh, on, on a regular basis and should hopefully be meeting again soon, and, uh, and they will kind of take the kind of key decisions on this, and there's a, uh, a host of support instructions underneath that will make recommendations to our ministers to, to take a view on that, and, and of course, ultimately, you know, we ensure our leaders are, are kept informed of, of, of progress as well. So there is. I think you know, a fairly rigorous process um, to, to, to identify things. But at the same time, we don't want to be kind of getting in a way of using AUKUS as an inspiration for, for doing other things. And we touched earlier on, on what the services are doing. We're seeing some really brilliant initiative being taken by services uh, aligned with AUKUS. I, I describe it in many cases, uh, but not necessarily needing that kind of formal branding of the, uh, of the project. We have time for a few more, I think. Front. Or, sorry, over here, sir. Oh, you're, you're, you're first, I think. 
Oh, me. Okay. So, Win Bone from Kings. I'm the Kings lead on s and Plus. So, I got a question on um, the relationship between AUKUS and other minilateral groupings. And I think, Matt, you were getting at some of that just then. And the benefits of AUKUS to other allies and partners. Um, so, I guess my question is, well, my preamble still is, the three members of AUKUS are also in Five Eyes, the Combined Space Operations Center, Operation Olympic Defender, all those sorts of things. So are there discussions in AUKUS, for example, around space collaboration and Pillar 2 and the dark radars? Um, any discussions about how that effort feeds into these other initiatives, which will benefit other countries, like, like Canada or New Zealand? You know, I think um, you know, the French and the Germans are in the Combined Space Operations Center now as well. Mm -hmm. So just to, any thoughts you have would be great. Yeah, I think I think first and foremost, um, you know, again, stepping back to the U.S. national security strategy, the Indo-Pacific strategy, um, and a lot of our work, the vision is that um, one of our greatest strengths is um, in our partnerships and recognizing that our our previous partnership type approach was. Um, you know, to overly simplify, it was sort of, you know, a U.S. hub and spoke type model. Uh, maybe there'll be a multiple spokes for different initiatives. But now trying to move towards um, what, uh, you know, I don't know who coined it, but I know I hear Deputy Secretary Campbell all the time uh, use it, but that's lattice work of partnerships. Where, especially in the Indo-Pacific, you see lots of different versions on focused on different topics. And what that does is it bolsters the resiliency, in many ways, of our partnerships. And um, so, in short, are there is there dialogue between these different groupings or the, the coordinators and so forth? Yes, there is. And they're very different, right? Like Five Eyes is, uh, often people say, well, that's a, a, you already have a Five Eyes partnership. Um, well, that's an intelligence sharing partnership, right? Um, there's, there's very specific things for each of these. Um, but w for example, we talk a lot to our um, members that, that uh, work on the quad. And we try to see, are there things that you know, make sense or do we just need to deconflict? Or um, are there areas that uh, you know, our messaging needs to be coordinated or there are opportunities to collaborate? And so um, there are a lot of those kind of internal conversations that go on mm -hmm. as these activities come up. Um, and um, uh, you know, on, on various capabilities, I'm sure at the, the Pentagon, they also do the same thing related to some of the that, uh, specifics that you mentioned. Yeah. You could learn something from the way Australia is organized because they've got the quad, shipbuilding, and AUKUS all in one office in PMET. We don't do that. Uh, Roy Gutman from the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. <clears throat> um, in, in, in addressing the general public, uh, how do you define the threat that AUKUS is responding to? <clears throat> what is the political goal for dealing with it? Uh, what is the strategy beyond uh, building a nuclear submarine? I, I mean, it looks like a f the framework for a future alliance if the balloon goes up. <clears throat> yeah, so I think... Yeah, I think particularly interesting for, for, for UK as, as a nation not in the uh, in the Indo-Pacific. But yeah, our focus here is 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 on the free and open Indo-Pacific. That's a clear objective uh, for us, uh, one we want to work with partners on, and, and that's in, in in all our national our, our national strategies. Uh, why is that important to us as a non-Pacific nation? Well, it's clearly the Indo-Pacific is is a, is a great focus of a future t trade, a future economic growth, but also the potential. Um, uh, starting point for, 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 for kind of global crises that we, we might we might see coming. So that's why, for us, it's really important to focus on this and and supporting that that, that free and open um, Indo-Pacific. Um, you mentioned at the end the idea of possibly becoming an alliance uh, uh, or the bedrock for a future alliance. Again, I, I, I would, would would counter that. There's nothing in AUKUS um, that would lend itself for a kind of future alliance structures. Um, we may have some joint capabilities, um, but uh, we've involved in other joint capability programs over the years. It doesn't uh, tie us uh, to a particular kind of foreign policy uh, objective from, from, from my perspective. It's no, it's no secret the risk is China. Mm. And China has been very aggressive in the South China Sea. They've militarized the South China Sea. 
Um, a goal has been to influence the economies in the world, but especially in the Pacific and uh, Southeast Asia. And if you look at World War II, what was the Japanese policy to have, have the resources of Southeast Asia and cut Australia off from England and the US? Nuclear submarines are the best way, as I understand it, to make sure blockades and uh, things of that nature don't work. In addition to that, to that capability is all these other te 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 uh, technologies because as our leaders keep saying, that's where the battle of the future is going to be held, quantum, hypersonics, AI. So we're all gonna work together on those. Uh, I'm really glad you asked this question. Um, I'm a strategic planner by, by trade in many aspects of state, um, including helping write part of the state USAID joint strategic plan that's out now. Um, you know, the, what, one of my first questions when I came in um, focused on AUKUS was, what's our strategic uh, intent? What's our strategic why? And um, I always got the same answer, deterrence. Okay, tell me how you measure deterrence. Mm -hmm. And how do you define deterrence? Uh, so to me, I went back and looked at the, Indo the again, the national security strategy, Indo-Pacific strategy underneath that, um, then some of the public statements by uh, the Secretary of State, especially for, for me on um, our China policy, on Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, and that's where I see um, the thread of why AUKUS, what, what we're trying to achieve here and why I don't think it's just that end state of um, submarine deter. Mm -hmm. I think it's more than that. I think it is about this, how are we bolstering, evolving our partnership uh, model? How are we ensuring that we're, um, and there's multiple objectives here, I think that we have to demonstrate to the region that we are um, committed um, to peace and stability. Um, and yes, there is a deterrent piece there um, through some of the work from our, our defense colleagues. But I also think that there's more in the people to people ties space that is not quite an AUKUS activity, um, but I think we need to focus on because if, there, if our um, uh, competitors or adversaries ever do decide to go down that wrong path, in my view, towards conflict, then those people to people ties are gonna be all the more important and let's face it, we have uh, uh, collectively, we have focused elsewhere um, for a long time and we need to re rejuvenate those people to people ties. And that's a lot of the work that the State Department um, does in, in public and private dip diplomacy. We've covered a lot of ground. I think we have time for one more very quick question if anyone has a burning question that they'd like to throw out there. I, I was speaking to your former Prime Minister Turnbull the other day yep. who thinks the French are so angry they will never come around. Yep. I think that's incorrect. They have strategic interests and their strategic interests are pretty enormous and they don't really have the capability to secure that big territory in the South Pacific without working with us. I do think we need to do more outreach to the French, somehow bring them into a collective agreement, maybe with New Zealand, on how we're all going to work with the Pacific Islands to address their concerns, mm -hmm. especially about climate change. And uh, yeah, it'll be a process, but I think that's a huge opportunity. Great. Well, thank you all very much. I'd love to invite you to thank our panelists.